If the Native Americans who inhabited Haiti were not living in paradise in pre-Columbian times, at least they were free of European disease and disruption. They lived in relative harmony, despite occasional conflicts with strangers from nearby islands, particularly the often hostile Caribs. But these encounters were mild compared to the warlike ferocity that came with the Europeans. The natives called their island Haiti, the hilly land, and it was into these hills they fled with the invasion of Columbus and his horde. Led by the Kashyyyks, their chiefs, the natives presented a stiff resistance for a while. But given the superior weaponry of the invaders, it was only a matter of time before their precious homeland was in the hands of the violent men in the tall ships. When Christopher Columbus set sail for the so-called New World near the end of the 15th century, he had two things on his mind, God and gold. Ultimately, he discovered only one thing, that he was lost. And soon so would be the lives of millions of Africans as the Italian sailor opened the portals to the Atlantic slave trade. First of all, I'm, I've always been an optimist and I'm an optimist. I always look at, let's say, uh, the history of my country from the point of view of the glass being half full as opposed to a glass being half empty. And if you permit me, I'll go back to history. Unfortunately, as an historic architect, I am forced to make an analysis of an object based on the original program. What was the original program of 500,000 slaves when they took their food, they took their independence in 1804? They inscribed that in blood on their flag. Live free or die. In 1789, the French West Indian colony of San Domingo supplied two thirds of the overseas trade of France and was the greatest individual market for the European slave trade. It was an integral part of the economic life of the age the greatest colony in the world, the pride of France, and the envy of every other imperialist nation. The whole structure rested on the labor of a half a million slaves. The one could trap the African captives like animals and transport them in pens and work them alongside an ass or a horse and beat both with the same stick, stable them and starve them. They remained, despite their black skins and curly hair, quite invincibly human beings with the human intelligence and resentments to cow them into the necessary docility and acceptance necessitated a regime of calculated brutality and terrorism. And it is this that explains the unusual spectacle of property owners apparently careless of preserving their property. They had first to ensure their own safety. CLR James, the Black Jacobins. Brothers, friends, I have taken vengeance. I want liberty and equality to reign in San Domingo. I want to bring them into existence. Unite yourselves to us, brothers, and fight with us for the same cause. Your very humble and obedient servant, Toussaint Leoverture, General of the Armies of the King for the Public Good. As, a, as an American uh, educated professional linked to the concept of Anglo-Saxon, I'm always looking at things in terms of what would have been the precedent in front of that catastrophe. And the only thing that comes to mind is Henry Christophe standing on the fourth and the fourth of their occupation, the general, the brigade of the French army, 
looking at the biggest fleet ever sent from Europe. Uh, with an army that is led by the, the brother-in-law of Napoleon, mm -hmm. whose only purpose is to bring those guys back to slavery. And here he is at the pinnacle of his power, looking at what destiny has for him and what does he do. He destroyed the city, starting with his, with his own house, waged a war that led to him becoming later chief of state, and rebuilt the city of Capetian and built a new capital with 28 buildings in the city that you love so much, which is Milo, in less than 18 years. And the Medici is the president. Uh, and the interesting thing about it is that his only Ministry of Education was an African American, a guy named Prince Sanders, who was a graduate of the University of Philadelphia at that time. Other than the emergence of negritude and expression of Haitian nationalism in the arts and sciences, very little distinguishes Haitian culture until the first decade of the 20th century and the conflict against the invading U.S. Marines. The Marines arrived in 1914 and went directly to the vaults of the National Bank of Haiti and confiscated $500,000. This theft was tantamount to France's demand of reparations in 1825 when the Haitian government began the payments of 90 million francs. Port-au-Prince, Haiti, in 1915, chief city of an island nation torn by internal troubles. Behind these scenes of peace and semi-tropic tranquility, there's uneasiness and unrest. And then in 1915, United States Marines land in Haiti to battle Haitian bandits, threatening destruction of American properties. And native bandits quickly head for the hills. This puts immediate end to troubles in populated areas, but Marines prepare to drive into interior and rout the insurgents out. Haiti's own Dartiguanov is elected provisional president, and the riot-ridden republic begins to function as a nation once again. Here are troops of the Palace Guard, but United States Marines are ever present. For more than a score of years, the Marines occupied Haiti and maintained martial law. In 1934, the U.S. ended its occupation, but by then had set the stage for the arrival of Francois Duvalier, Papa Doc, who was elected president in 1957. Aided and abetted by his dreaded Tonton Moku, his murderous death squads, Duvalier governed under draconian policies. His despotic rule and the plunder of the national economy was continued by his son, Jean-Claude Duvalier, the notorious Baby Doc. From 1971 to 1986, Baby Doc carried on his family's infamous legacy until he was toppled and fled to France where he remains in exile. When Jean Bertrand Aristide, running as a populist, was elected president in 1990, millions of Haitians celebrated believing at last the government had a democratically elected leader who could stabilize the troubled nation. They were wrong. Within months of his inauguration, Aristide was the victim of a coup d'etat, a removal instigated by the Bush administration. So began a carousel of changes that brought René Preval to power from 1996 to 2000, making him Haiti's first elected president to serve a full term. Four years later, Aristide would be back in the National Palace, but once again, the U.S. government was not satisfied with his policies, and he was virtually abducted from Haiti, delivered to Africa, where today he remains in exile. 